Kamala Harris will fall, hold her final rally here on the Rocky Steps. In a few hours from now, the message will be one of unity, but also to get out and vote on Election Day. We know that more than 77 million Americans have already voted, but uh, both of these candidates want millions more to vote for them. It could all come down to Pennsylvania. I want to bring in now our US politics analyst and former US ambassador, Joe Hockey. Joe, great to see you. Uh, there's so many changes and twists and turns in this campaign. The momentum has shifted uh, a number of times as well. What are you looking at on election eve? Where do you think it's headed? Well, it still remains too close to call, uh, but I am starting to get intelligence that uh, the early voter turnout for uh, Kamala Harris hasn't happened, and uh, she hasn't had the surge in support that people were expecting. There's also a lot of information coming out uh, in Pennsylvania about um, key aspects of the Harris campaign that are failing to obtain the same advantage as Joe Biden. Uh, for example, um, there is a large Jewish community in Philadelphia. Uh, they broke 70% uh, to Biden, 30% uh, to Trump last time. The current polling has them at 50-50, and that could mean a shift of 40,000 votes uh, from the Democrat Democratic Party to Trump. Now, that alone could potentially tip Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a few other uh, micro details that are starting to come through that are indicating that Trump is getting more momentum uh, and uh, Harris is, is waning in her support. Well, that's so interesting. Look, I'm here at the final uh, Harris rally of the campaign, so the people you speak to on the ground here aren't exactly uh, a good litmus test of what is going on. But it's interesting that you talk about Pennsylvania in particular and the early vote, because in 2016, when Trump won Pennsylvania, the, the black Democratic base failed to turn out for Hillary. Now, it swung back to Joe Biden in 2020 because he is essentially a local. He's a Pennsylvanian. But, I mean, Kamala Harris doesn't have that advantage that Joe Biden has. Well, that's right. Seen as, as a member of the Pennsylvania family, uh, whereas the same cannot be said for uh, Kamala Harris, who hails from California. You know, the, the, the other thing is, uh, it, it remains the case that Harris has failed to separate herself from incumbency. And as we keep seeing day after day, the one reliable poll you can absolutely trust is the fact that 70% of Americans feel the country's heading in the wrong direction under Biden-Harris. Now, what Harris has done is tried to establish an anti-Trump coalition uh, and, in doing so, unite people against Trump. Now, that's happened for the last two elections. That's what Biden did. That's what Clinton did. The question in my mind is what makes this anti-Trump sentiment new and exciting and frankly, uh, there's not a lot to go on for the Harris campaign. Meanwhile, Trump is really prosecuting no, and coming home with a wet sail, arguing about uh, the slowing US economy, the fact that cost of living is up, and that immigration remains a very real issue for many Americans. Yeah, we saw that today. He was in North Carolina talking about uh, immigration and the economy, combining those two issues together, saying if the immigration issue isn't sorted out, he's threatening now 25% tariffs uh, on Mexico. When I was in Michigan just a couple of days ago, and even here in Pennsylvania, that kind of economic message is resonating. I still feel like he has the upper hand on Kamala when it comes to the economy and costs of living. And, you know, flat out, just yesterday, one guy said to me, I was richer when Trump was in power. How potent is that message and that feeling? Oh, it, it, it's everything. Uh, look, it, it, any incumbent government anywhere in the world is in trouble because uh, high inflation hurts the working class the most. It really does. The cost of living pressures associated with everyday living are really tough on the working class. And when you see that 70% of the unionised truck drivers in America voted within the Teamsters Union 
to endorse Donald Trump. And at the other end of the spectrum, he's got the richest man on the face of the earth, Elon Musk, endorsing him. What brings those two parties together is a focus on economics. And economics is going to be more important than other social issues. We've heard hardly anything about health and education. And as you and I know, uh, the left in politics usually win when they're talking about health, ed education and climate change. The right usually win when they're talking about the economy, national security, personal security. And this election, of all the policy issues debated, we've hardly heard anything about health and education and virtually nothing at all about climate change. Uh, yet everything is still about uh, the economy or Donald Trump. Yeah, but abortion is a health issue, particularly for women, and that's how they're seeing it. So perhaps they're where, that's where the difference lies when she's speaking to female voters. Now, there's a lot of stock uh, being put, Joe, in the fact that female voters are motivated by you know, having rights over their own body, the whole abortion issue, Roe v Wade, and that they will turn out for Kamala. But going back to your, your first answer, you think there's some evidence to the contrary on that too? Well, that's right. I mean, early voting numbers out of a number of key states are indicating that female voters have not been turning out in the same numbers as they did for Joe Biden in early voting. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to make up for it on polling day. There's simply change from mail-in voting or, or, or what we call in Australia pre-polling. They've changed to voting on, on polling day. But it doesn't augur well at all for, for Kamala Harris. And Look, I just pose this question to you. Um, it, you know, Trump got more white female votes than Hillary Clinton in 2016 and Joe Biden in 2020. And in both cases, uh, he was uh, supporting and, and, in fact, delivered uh, a Supreme Court that would revoke Roe v Wade. The question in my mind is why all of a sudden is a female vote turning against him when they, in vast numbers, voted for him in 2016 and 2020. And the question is, is it because he's up against a female candidate? Well, he was up against a female in 2016. Uh, the only issue I can find is that now that the states actually do have the power on abortion, that it's become a much more material issue for women. But other than that, I'm not, I, I just don't know what the difference is between the three elections. Well, when you say other than that, I mean, they're living the consequences of it. Uh, I think that's the biggest factor in all of this, isn't it? When you go across state lines, there are different rights and, you know, different states are seeing uh, different problems. If you are um, a, a state that is, you know, at 26 weeks rather than six weeks, you're seeing a 50% increase in some cases of people coming across the border trying to get those services. So isn't it just that lived experience? And I, and I think you're right. I, th I, th I think you're absolutely right. But the issue, the issue that is, is, you know, at a political level is the states that are most regressive on those laws like Alabama and Tennessee, are not even in play. Uh, the states where there is the most progressive attitude, like California or perhaps New York, uh, they're not in play either. The states that are actually in play, uh, in the main, have no debate about abortion within the state. So all I'm making the point is that the only point I'm making is it seems to be an issue that is a, a multiple levels away from female voters. And so I really wonder whether that female vote is going to turn against Trump in the way people are predicting. Yeah, right, I get what you're saying. It's not just a, a single issue that, that women are voting on, not one homogenous group either. They've got different uh, priorities within the swing states. Uh, Joe, before I let you go, and I'll, I'll see you in Washington tomorrow. I'll be moving uh, close to you uh, since you landed in San Francisco, I think a week ago now. But I want to ask you about the, um, the whole issue of voter fraud and whether if Donald Trump loses this election, whether he will accept that result. Uh, what do you think? Because in the last couple of rallies, in the last couple of days, you know, he's got a few tells. When he feels like he's losing momentum, he starts going down the path of, 
you know, voter fraud and uh, dubious claims to that effect. Well, I know firsthand that Donald Trump doesn't like losing, and I think the whole world knows it from uh, the outcome <laughs> of the 2020 election. Uh, the bottom line is uh, this election is it, it overwhelmingly, in the main, going to be well run. Uh, all the evidence is that wherever there have been weaknesses, individual jurisdictions have uh, fixed up their uh, processes. I hope they get the results out early, uh, and that depends a lot on uh, state and county officials. If they get it out, it doesn't give Donald Trump any oxygen to make the claim that the, the, that the, uh, he, the election was, was a fraudulent result in certain places. The second thing that it encourages me is um, the US intelligence agencies, in particular the FBI, have been moving very quickly on fake AI uh, videos on Instagram and Facebook and so on that have been uh, created by malevolent foes overseas to create the perception that there is fraud happening at the ballot box. Uh, so I don't think anyone's really going to entertain a, a serious debate about fraud in this election. Uh, it will just uh, look like a sore loser from if Donald Trump loses. And if uh, Kamala Harris loses, then I'm sure the Democrats uh, will, if she gets a majority of the votes nationally, but not the Electoral College, I'm sure they'll say again that they want to abolish the Electoral College and just go straight to a popular vote. But either way, uh, the American people will decide in good faith. <laughs> Joe Hockey, so great to see you. I'll see you in Washington, D.C. tomorrow, where I think it's a little bit chillier here than Philly, but really nice for this time of year, yes. and we'll take it. We'll see you soon, Joe. It's... <laughs> see you then. Thanks a lot for that. Well, with just one day to go until the U.S. Election Day, make sure you join us for live coverage all day tomorrow. Kieran Gilbert will host our coverage with Annalise Nielsen, Paul Murray, James Morrow, Laura Jays and Peter Stefanovic in key locations across the United States as all the results come in. That's all day tomorrow.